Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. Tonight, we present another episode of Conversations With. We have the great Mario Van Peebles uh, and his two children to talk to us about a new short film that speaks to um, safeguarding our next generation of Black men. A very important film that I urge uh, all of you to watch, and it's certainly a title that has earned AFCA's recommends uh, seal, which Mario will be getting to you tonight. Wow, okay. Uh, now, of course, everyone knows Mario uh, as an actor, director. Obviously, he is the son of, you know, the great one, uh, Mr. Melvin Van Peebles, who is the uh, grandfather of contemporary uh, Black cinema. And so we are absolutely thrilled to see Mr. Van Peebles' legacy continues, not only with his son, but also with his grandchildren. So without further ado, we're going to start our conversation. So Mario, tell me, what was the impetus for getting this project started, for doing this? Yeah, so what happened was years ago, I, I, um, I heard some statistics that I found alarming, which was that in certain schools, which were pretty much uh, split um, with black folks and white folks, um, we got a lot of, we got a higher percentage of the, the lower grades and started a conversation as to why that was. And they, they sent in some investigator from Africa, a brother from Africa to do this investigating in one particular school. I'll keep the story short for you. And he found that it wasn't that they were single parent homes. It wasn't that we spoke a at home. It, 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 it was what the kids, our black kids were watching a lot more media and what were they were watching were uh, gangster rap videos and videos that promoted the idea that being ignorant was somehow being hip. In other words, what the guy deduced was that we were getting nurtured on at an early age, a culture of anti-intellectualism, a culture that said to young brothers and young sisters, you want a real brother, you want a real nigga, you got to get you a guy that looks like this, he's sagging, he's doing this and that. You, if, the brother pushing the mop, that's the real brother, the guy who's doing the interview, the guy who's in the corporate world, the guy who's you know up there in that world has somehow, or the gal has somehow lost their roots and lost their blackness. It, it, so we had sort of, in a way, were buying into a voluntary slavery. And I maintain that the gangster rapper to me is like a modern day Uncle Tom in that they confirm for white folks that we are as violent, as hypersexed, as ignorant, you know, as, as we claim to be, or as, as they want to think we are. And that leads to the whole culture we're seeing now where, you know what, they're calling themselves the N-word. They're, call, they're, they're calling themselves this. They're saying they're making whole videos about shooting each other or whatever. So when we buy in to the zeitgeist, the values, of a people that would buy and sell us as a people, what have we become? And so I said, later for this, I'm in the business of media. How can I make a difference? So I said, well, look, I can make a difference because people call me back. So I say, there's other cats, we don't all agree, but I, because it was particularly young brothers were dropping out of high school. That's what it was. So I said, I want to make a, a, a little short film called Bring Your A Game. And I'm going to bring on Mandela and I'm bring on Maya. Maya was, Mandela was involved, Maya helped me cast, because you know, we're by any means necessary filmmaking family. So if you believe in something, you take action with it. So I said, let me do a short film and get brothers who are much more eloquent than myself to speak on it. So I reached out, I called Spike Lee, he said yes. I called Jamie Foxx, he said yes. I called Chris Rock, he said yes. I called uh, Lupe, Lupe Fiasco, P. Diddy, uh, Russell. Every one of us knew that, that regardless of whether they all agreed or not, brothers who looked like us were dropping out of school to rap or play ball 
And we needed to understand that if you try to be a dream team attorney and you fail, you'll still be a lawyer. If you try to be a, a, a brain surgeon and you fail, you'll still be a doctor. And so I said, we gotta let these brothers know the truth. It is, ignorance is not hip. Ignorance will, the system will pimp you. And Ice-T said it very well in Bring Your A Game. He said, don't let the system pimp you. You gotta pimp the system. The system is waiting for you to fail. The system is waiting for you to become a modern day slave incarcerated. That's my long answer, brother. But I felt like, and guess what? Every one of these cats that I called came for free. And I did it for free with my partner, Karen Williams, for free. We didn't, it was, it's online for free. It's called Bring Your A Game. I urge everyone to see it uh, and everyone, especially if you're a parent, uh, to see it. And, uh, and we did it because it was, we, we, we can't just sit by and wait for somebody else to do for us. So there you have it. You know, particularly since I'm talking to you, and again, you know, obviously to speak to your uh, uh, amazing uh, pedigree, le family legacy, I mean, what happened? I mean, to go from your dad's films and the movies of Gordon Parks and others uh, where the messaging was powerful, was, was, was elevating, was uplifting, was productive to the type of messaging that we see today in uh, black content. I mean, where did we go wrong? I mean, this is really falls on our shoulders because our parents certainly did their due and we sort of let it slip uh, off, you know, from our grasp and, and and being able to fortify these two handsome people sitting here and and others of their ilk. So where did we go? What 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 what's going on? What happened? Why where did the where did we lose direction? Well, that's a, you know that's I, it's always tricky to be called upon as a you know as a as, as a blackologist in a social way because I'm a filmmaker and I don't want to put anyone else's vision down. I may need them to give me a job tomorrow. I may have to work with them tomorrow. Absolutely. <laughs> but, but to your point, we all have, those of us in our generation, we all have to take responsibility. I mean, I know I certainly, unfortunately, do for profiting yeah. off of messaging that has not been yeah. necessarily so, um, helpful. Sometimes I think what's happened is, and I saw this happening with my generation, we were inadvertently getting confused and we were starting to take Malcolm's by freedom by any means necessary and Martin's freedom by peaceful means necessary and substitute money for that and say, get paid by any means necessary. And the minute that you fall into the trick bag of confusing money with freedom, you fall in prey to what I, what I said earlier, you be, you're starting to become an adopt the values of those who would commodify you. So you have to stop and go, wait a minute now, money, money can have freedom, but not everyone who makes money is doing something positive. You know, so you'll see a guy say, why are you making the rap song hating on women or hating on your sisters or talking about that? Well, that's what it sells. Well, crack sells too. It doesn't mean it's good for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Why are you making a movie showing us being jigaboos and buffooning and cooning? Well, it sells. We like it. Well, you know, junk food sells too. It doesn't mean it's nutritional for you. Do you know what I mean? So you, you and my kids get on me because I, I, they're like, dad, make a movie that doesn't have anything to say. Just make a regular movie. You know? And I'm not like, yeah, yeah, that's just not my thing. You know, I'll, I, I make a film, but here's the thing. There's something else that I remember my dad wrote a book and we had a long discussion and my dad said, and, and I, I had this talk with brother Chris Rock, who's very sharp too. He said, Dr. King's dream wasn't just that the talented 10th, the extraordinary brother or sister could make it. There will always be a Spike Lee. There will always be a Malcolm. There will always be a, 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 a P. Diddy or someone who comes up, right? We will always have a talented 10th, whoever that person is, an Issa Rae, whoever it is. It wasn't that the talented person could break through. It was that the average brother or sister could make it, just like the average white person could make it. Do you know what I mean? You, you, you don't have to be in a, a Michelle or a Barack. They're going to make it. Do you know what I mean? The Van Peebles family, we've done okay. But there are a lot of smart brothers and sisters out there who will never have the opportunity. And that's what it was about. So to some degree, what I would say is, we also have the right in film, we should have the right to do dumb shit. They can make dumb and dumber. We should be able to do our dumb shit. 
The problem is we don't always have the diversity. They get a beautiful mind. They get all these other, all this other representation. So here's the thing. I remember having to talk with, I had all the directors over my crib and I got to let them speak. I had all these directors over my crib. You know, Singleton was there. The Hudlins were there. Gary F. Gray was there. Vonnie was there. And we all started, we laughing and dissing each other's movies. They called my movie New Jack Shitty. I was jumping. We were all clowning because that's what we do as a people when we get together. And it was fun. And then we looked around the room and, and, I, and we started talking about, I remember it was years ago, we talked about Dennis Rodman. And we all got a kick out of Dennis Rodman. Why? Because we could afford to. Because when everyone on the court is black, Dennis Rodman can have pink hair, marry himself, date Madonna, do whatever. And everyone says, that's just that freaky Negro. It's cool. He is now allowed to be his freaky self. But when there's only three brothers on the court, we need all of them to be perfect. You see? And filmically, we're still at a place where we're, to some degree, ambassadors for self. You see what I'm saying? But when we have enough diversity, we should have Issa doing her thing. Mr. Perry should do his thing. The Van Peebles family should do their thing. And you should be able to go to the movie or turn on the TV and say, I can see us as presidents and I can see us as hood rats. I can see us as doctors and I can see us as dumb and dumber. It's that we lack the diversity sometimes. And so we're still stuck in a trick bag where that cop who pulls you over might have just seen you represented as a gangster rapper, as a this, and you calling yourself and treating your own women a certain way, what makes you think they're going to treat you any better than you treat yourself? Wow. If I could add to that, actually, I think um, another reason why we're kind of seeing the shift in consciousness and content that's out there is we're not controlling the media. We don't own the media. Mm. So when a movie like Sweetback gets made, that does have nutritional value to say that, um, and the streets and the community really resonate with it. The higher ups, the people with the power to make these films say, okay, black movies are making money, but we want that money. We don't want to empower them. How can we do this without having that message? And then you see the same stylistic type of films. You see the super flies and the shafts, but they're working for the big DEA cop, white guy, or something like that. So you don't have the same kind of message and symbolism that you do when it's coming from the ground up. Mm. And I think we can put out as much you know, great content as we want, but we need those people in positions of power to help us support it. And we need the people who are you know, watching it to vote with their dollar, really. If people pay to see something, then they're gonna make more of it. And that's really how we can kind of control what, we're, what content we're bringing in and out. <coughs> See what I'm saying? That's why I sent the boy to school for stuff like that. <laughs> very eloquent, very eloquent. I see that the apple hasn't fallen very far, far from the tree. Well, hopefully it's a good apple because we're hearing a lot on the news lately about bad apples. You know what I mean? They, they, the cop puts his knee on your throat and says, well, this is a bad apple. Chris Rock did that thing. He said, you can't have no bad airline pilots. You can't have no bad heart surgeons. You got to have a way to get the bad apples. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. We'll, we'll, we'll stay with the apple metaphor since you, you turned it around. Absolutely, absolutely. Does your daughter have anything to add? Well, I think one of the other issues that we're facing today is that it's not necessarily just about what we're doing with our black dollars, it's what white audiences want to see. And I think that there needs to be some sort of higher standard for gatekeeping our community and the things that are for us. Because if you look at who's buying these, who's seeing these movies, who's buying this music, it's not us. Mm, yeah. It's young white men who are perpetuating these stereotypes. And I know a lot of artists have recently struggled going more towards the music side with doing concerts and it's a crowd full of white faces shouting the N-word back at them. We have to hold ourselves accountable a little bit more in what we're putting out there because it's not just us digesting it. We have to kind of recognize now that our culture isn't the minority anymore. It's mm. become pop culture. And although we are still the minority, our culture is what's cool and what people are after. So by infusing racy things and um, politically incorrect stuff into the fabric of our culture, the N word, the, the, you know, all, every, every, you know, all the things that come with street life and making that popular, to the populace, 
that means all races. And that's something that we have to kind of navigate. And we don't, I don't feel that the black community has the agency that some other communities do when they feel they've been um, wronged, you know, per se. And we need to really be able to stand up together and say, you know, we, that's not okay. We don't want to see this from people not of color saying the N-word in their songs or, you know, di different things. But I feel like it's, we, we give passes a lot and we don't need to. I, don't, I feel like we're in a position of, oh, if we just are passive, it'll just, it's smoother that way. But we can, we have the power now to, to have a voice. And I think, uh, I think we should use it. Yeah, and I think going off of that and piggybacking off of what Mandela said, everyone wants to act black, but nobody wants to be black. And so it's very hard when you have these young white kids, Asian, in Asian culture, now it's a huge thing to be into hip hop and they're getting these perms to do their hair like us and all these things. But then when it comes, comes to social issues, are you backing that support? If you care so much about black music, black film, sports, all of those things, are you backing the black athletes and the black actors and all of us who are being persecuted? When That's kneel, the issue. When they kneel, are you supporting them? Or are you just supporting them when they're playing the game? Wow. We've been commodified for <laughs> I am blown away by the two of you. <laughs> and this is the next generation, Mario? My goodness. Welcome. Yeah, it's cool, you know, they're, they're, they're thinkers and they're, they, they keep me fresh because they, they, they see things from a different perspective, uh, and that's lovely. Um, you know, it, we were just having a conversation earlier today about that, you know, we have a lot of discussions around our table. We had, we are having a healthy lunch. And by the way, after we talk to you, we're going to all plank together. So we're going to do 15 minutes of abs. We're going to plank together. You know, <laughs> the family that planked together, stank together. So, <laughs> so, so, but we, we hang out and we have these conversations. It's an, it's an interesting thing to see, uh, you know, where we're going. We have, we are, I think Maya and Mandela have it right in that black culture in many ways has become more mainstream. And yet we haven't, we have to process, you know, what that means because with all due respect, if you're out at your favorite club and you're sitting there pumping your jam, you're going to sing along. And if the, if the the jam, if you're a little white girl and, or a boy and you're at spring break in Mexico and it gets to the N-word, do you not sing the word? Right. If no one black is around, you go, look, we go, <laughs> we go, and you, it puts you in that awkward position as, as, the, as the black friend or the someone there that you go, wow, so how I are we doing that? I love to the party. you going to say yeah. something. I love you know it. So, so we, we have to, you know, but the thing is, look, man, you know, we, we were thoroughly colonized. You know, we, when, when they can teach you, look, uh, and here's it, we, we're getting this whole thing right now about, you know, the Confederate flag or Confederate symbolism, right? I, I say, absolutely, we should get rid of Confederate symbolism. But at the same point, I think it's not just taking out a negative, it's putting in a positive. I want to see Sister Harriet Tubman somewhere. You know, I want to see Sojourner somewhere. I want to see George Washington Carver somewhere. I want to see people of color on the money somewhere. I want to see Native, our Native American brothers and sisters somewhere. So it's, it's almost like I was saying about cinema is that the, the, when it's just been white male supremacy carved in the mountaintop, then, and, and not folks that look like you who made big contributions, it's not just a discussion about what you're subtracting, it's a, a question about what you're adding and what you're recognizing. I think America's you know, we, we're having a conversation with ourselves. Uh, and we're, we, it's an interesting time, brother. Well, fortunately, it's the three of you on the camera and not me. I've got, I've got to give it up, clearly. <laughs> but um, let's talk about the film more. What are your plans for distribution? Are you, I know it's already on YouTube, but are you forming any kind of partnerships with film festivals or with academic institutions, libraries? Etc. How do you plan on platforming this and really getting this message out to as many people possible? Brother, you're it. We, we, we want to do as many interviews as possible as we can. Talk to people. This is a grassroots effort. It's called Bring Your A Game. It's been out for a while and people come up to me when they find Bring Your A Game on YouTube and they go, wow, why didn't I know about this sooner? So I say, it's free. We said we, we didn't, weren't trying to make money on it. So Pass it. Why don't you reach out to me? You, we've known each other for a minute. 
we're, we're, we're in our mouth, man. So it's like that drum. We, we're hearing it right now. You know, especially if you're a single parent. I think it's, my kids, y'all just really watched it, right? Yeah, some of, the, some of the, the messages in the, you've seen it. The messages and the visuals are pretty powerful. Yeah. I also want to say, after rewatching it again just a couple hours ago, it's not discouraging creativity. It's not saying don't chase your passion if you are into the arts or you want to do music or you want to act or you do uh, want to play a sport, you're athletic. It's simply saying have a plan B. And whether you're lucky enough to be one of those top 10% who do make it to the professional level, whether it be rapping, uh, sports, or acting, even still, many cases, it's not enough to sustain yourself if you don't know how to invest correctly. So education is really key no matter what stage you're, you're in in your life or what your goal is, you need to learn how to hold on to the money, just not just make it. And I think, you know, we have example after example of, you know, the football player going broke or, you know, rapper going broke. And, and that's something that we never seem to learn from. And I, I just, it's interesting to see that even if you are the luckiest of the lucky to make it, the odds of you being the Michael Jordan are even slimmer. And that's, you gotta have the business sense. It's a, it's a duality and a balance. Mm -hmm. well, you said everything there, but hold on to the money. That's, that's really, you know, um, and have a plan. It's so essential, you know. Um, what, I mean, talking to your, your two youngins here, um, I mean, again, obviously you're more, you're aware of the, the fine legacy that you belong to. I mean, what else are you guys doing? What are you up to? What can we expect to see from uh, each of you in the future? Uh, well, I, I, you know, because of, uh, you know, that old thing, we make plans and, and God laughs, you know, you never know, especially in this business when, you, you know, I looked the other day and someone said, man, you've been doing it for a minute. I've been self-employed for, you know, ever since I left my job as a budget analyst in New York City under the, the Koch administration. Uh, I've been, you know, I never really know what's next. And, and, it, and it, you know, when you look back at it, Clint Eastwood said to me when I did Heartbreak Ridge, he said, Mario, no one can be flavor of the month for 30 years, you know? And I've been, I've been able to hang in there. Uh, but it, it, it also means that, you know, I've also been able to diversify. I got into acting. I didn't appreciate the roles that we were being offered back then. So I started directing. I wanted to be a job creator, not just a job seeker. I still acted. As I was directing, I didn't appreciate the lack of diversity I saw in scripts. So I got into writing. I got into writing. I didn't appreciate the lack of funding. So I got into producing. So each one of those steps led me further. And my father, who had said- You're your dad's son, I was gonna say, that's- My dad, thank you, early on said, you know, show business is a business, have some financial literacy, some understanding of the business side. Some dads can teach you to play ball. I'll try to teach you to own the team. So that in whatever business you love, you can figure out how to monetize it and, and, and be a boss in that business. And I've done okay with it, you know, so, so you never fully know, but what I, what I do have on the horizon, <laughs> I have a Western that I'm, um, you know, I did that Western posse back in the day and enough people have been coming up to me and saying, it's time. We want to see another Western from you. And I was just talking to Sally the other day. There you go. Yeah. And, and what did Sally learn? I mean, she took off and started directing. I said, that's, that, it makes me smile to see a sister who kept her beauty. You know, good looks is not a gift, brother. Pretty, Man. I tell these two, pretty is temporary, dumb is forever. <laughs> right? So good looks is alone. Sally kept hers and she's smart and she got her family. And it, I, I just look at her go, go on girl. So it's really nice to see that happen, especially for a sister where she says, I seen, I seen Mario do it. I've seen the brothers do it. I've seen Keenan. I've seen Blair. I'm a pickup. I'm going to do it. And, and, and that's really great. So I have a Western that I'm putting together. It's going to saddle up in when we get figure out the COVID. We're, we're joking about maybe doing a reality show because they're so fun and articulate. And we do have drama. We have real drama that we're not afraid to share. You know what I mean? So we're, we're good. We're, we're, we're playing with that idea. And if we did it, 
it would be a real reality show because you have all these filmmakers would film it ourselves. So it could be really fun to shoot what's really behind the scenes at the Van People's household when we talk and smack to each other, you know, that, that, that's fun stuff to see. And it's got the love, you know, so we're talking about doing that. Um, I have a couple other scripts I've written and I'm writing a script that may turn into a book about the birth of modern black cinema through the eyes of the family. So we're, I, I think my family's kind of like the Jacksons. We just don't have the talent, you know, <laughs> or not the singing talent anyway. So I guess that would make Granddad Joe, or maybe I'm Joe sometimes. I don't, but but what I what it would be was it starts out with Melvin, you know, you know, figuring out how to be a filmmaker, having to go to France, uh, on up, you know, him meeting Gordon, him meeting uh, Ozzy, on up to myself directing it. Twenty years later with New Jack City on the cover of the New York Times with. Brother Spike Lee and the Hudlins and Singleton and Maddie Rich and all those, all those. So, you know, you really see it hands on, you know, through the eyes of a mother. And there's not a lot of father son teams. And then now with my kids who were, you know, Maya produced a, a couple pictures for me and Mandela came on as an executive producer. So the boy looked good, but he also took his money that he saved on roots, gave it to me to make a film, part of a film with, because I make, I make you a film at a dollar 99, you know what I mean? So he gave it to me, we made a movie, then I gave him back his money, but he wanted more, so I had to give him a little extra something. And my daughter, you know, she comes on and loves bossing people around. She'll tell, she'll tell five Negroes what to do in a hot minute, and with style. <laughs> she, she's my little lady boss. Um, so it's been bring your kids to work day for the last 20 years, you know, and, and so in terms of me, that's what I'm doing. Mandela will speak for him, and Maya can tell you what they're doing. Man, I'm trying not to catch Corona. <laughs> no, I uh, and bring it back to my old ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, I've um, I've been just taking this time to reflect, and uh, it's it's kind of nice, man. It's interesting. At first, it's it, we're really uh, as human beings, we're we're so uh, what's the word adaptive? Yeah, yeah. Really resilient. We're so resilient. Mm -hmm. Our after a week or two of doing something, that becomes a new normal. And I'm like, wow, I haven't drank in three months. Or I haven't hung out my, it's just, it's just normal now. So I've been using the time now. I've been writing a lot, working on scripts. So teaching myself how to, how to use Final Draft and um, also trying to learn some coding for app development. Um, all kind of stuff, really. Just while I have the time, like we said, uh, it's good to have other, other plans, plan A, plan B, plan C, and other streams of revenue possibly coming in and just want to explore those while I'm not missing out on opportunities like acting and stuff like that, since, since you can't do it right now. Um, and so I'm not as entertainment focused as the rest of my family. I actually work at a political compliance law firm downtown and we do election reporting. So we're gearing up for the November election. Um, and I think that given what's going on in the world with our current political structure and all that's happening, I think now more than ever, it's time to get young people engaged, get everyone out to vote and really commit ourselves to making a difference, not only for us, but for future generations. Because part of the problem is when you have such a redlining when it comes to opportunities and access and education and healthcare and wait funding, times and voting booths, all of these things, mm -hmm. they keep people of color down and we have to come together and try and implement change in a new system. Um, so every day I'm working towards getting the right people elected and making sure all their affairs are in order and everything's going great. So it's really just gearing up for November and making a real change on a political platform, not just at the national level, but at the local level as well. It is as important as who the sheriff is in some districts, your city council member, all of these things make a change. And I think part of what is lacking in, in our education is that even if you have money, you need to be engaged beyond yourself because A, money is not sustainable like that for people of color, but it's about making sure that everyone around you is doing better as well. So even if you have all the money in the world, you need to vote for access to healthcare for women to make a difference, to make a change. So that right now, healthcare shouldn't be tied to employment when we have record unemployment levels. It's about voting people in power who are gonna represent everyone and the entire system. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm like big on voting and like politics totally. and all we of that. Need everyone who's <laughs> marching today to vote tomorrow, man. Oh Absolutely. yeah. Because if you vote ahead of time, 
we don't have the same systems in place that are holding us down that we then need to march for. We have the protections to stay home and get better like other countries and make a difference. And I think so much of America is self-focused instead of the group that telling people, oh, don't wear a you have to wear a mask so others don't get sick. People don't care. It's about protecting all of us and making sure we're all doing well. And that's why every election, it's important to vote down the entire ballot and not just for the president. And I do this thing here because I'm the most politically engaged one in my family. I go through the ballot for me, all my siblings, anyone, any family members who live in different areas, and I send them who they should vote for, in my humble opinion, but I provide why they should do that. She puts it nice and easy. It's like yeah. we cheating on a Scantron or something. <laughs> Fill it in the bubbles. I'm easy. I did my service. And it's, about, it's about not just you voting, but getting everyone around you to right. vote. Yeah. Driving someone with you, making sure your younger cousin, your brother, the teenager across the street, you know, is registered to vote. And let me add to this. You know, in both uh, 08, what was it? What year did we go? 2012. I took them with me to campaign for the president. So we went to the swing state of Florida where they had folks of color standing in line for, in the hot sun forever. Luckily, a lot of them happened to be Haitian brothers and sisters and El Pas Francais. So she speaks French. So it was like, boom, we could do it. You know, it makes a difference. I am so thorough. I'm not surprised, but I am so thoroughly impressed by, uh, by your children, Mario. They are, wow. Well, thank, let me, let me, you. thank you, thank you very much. And let me just say thank that they're, they're a mom who put this together. Lisa Vitello is a, is a badass herself and, and we wouldn't be doing this interview and I wouldn't have these two beautiful kids without her help. And, uh, and, and it's been an awesome journey. So one of my favorite roles has been father. Um, so give us the socials, the social handles where yeah. you know, they can follow all of you and, and the film? Yes, so I think for A Game, it's bring your A Game. Just go online, go on, on YouTube. And is that where you saw it, Maya? Yeah, on, right on, on YouTube. YouTube. And then I'm on Instagram. I'm verified on Instagram, Mario Van Peebles on Instagram. And I will actually hit you back. So people make comments and say things. Follow me, Mario Van Peebles on Instagram. and Join I will... him for a plank challenge online. Yeah, I do a little plank challenge every now and then because we have to stay in shape with this COVID out here. It is not playing. You know, people have You're to- You're still play. looking good, man. I Thank mean, you. you still got it. Thank you, brother. And Mandela? Uh, yeah, my Instagram is just my name, Mandela Van Peebles. So that's that. Yeah, <laughs> kept it simple. Maya Van Peebles on all platforms, same. But I, I don't try to make it seem like I don't talk to people. I, I talk to people and respond and have a good time on Instagram too. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> There you have it. That's how you reach us. Well, this is fantastic. And of course, you can stay connected with AFCA at AAFCA uh, on Instagram and also on Twitter at The AFCA. On behalf of the world's largest group of African-American of Black film critics, we thank you for watching tonight. And we also invite you to watch the rebroadcast of this uh, later on this weekend on the AFCA channel, which we also hope that you subscribe to. So everyone have a good evening, be safe, and we will see you soon. Thank you, brother, for having us on. Thank you for having us, Absolutely. You guys take care. Yeah.